Hey everyone, this is Mike Huber, founder and CEO of the Freshman Foundation. You are listening to the Freshman Foundation podcast, a podcast specifically about the transition from high school to college athletics. My guest today is David Karasek, Swiss swimming champion, a member of the 2012 Swiss Olympic swimming team, former University of Virginia swimmer and founder and CEO of the Tribe of Athletes. Uh, he's a mental performance and mindset coach. David, welcome to the podcast. How are you, my friend? Thanks for having me, Michael. Very good. I, besides what I just told you, that's been pissing here for five <laughs> days straight here in Switzerland and Zurich. But uh, I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me on, man. My pleasure. I think uh, I can say with certainty you're my first international guest. So we've we've crossed another milestone <laughs> here right. on the podcast today. Um, you know, I just really enjoyed the time we've we got to talk a little bit before and wanted to have the listeners learn more about your experiences as an athlete, but now also as a coach. So just if you, if you would, you know, just, could you tell everybody a little bit about yourself? Yeah, sure. So well, I guess long story short with the, cause I, I would love to also like ask you and, and speak about like the mindset part, but I, you know, I grew up swimming and then I had the pleasure and the opportunity to come to the States to the university of Virginia. And I had a 90% scholarship and that worked out so beautifully. And for me, you know, coming with, I was 20 years old, which, which is kind of on the older spectrum for a freshman, but I, you know, I, I just knew about America, the American Pie movie and like the Red Cubs, the Blue Cubs. And I got to the States and I absolutely loved it. I loved everything about it. And the thing that, and I'll tell you a funny story in a second, but the thing that I loved most was that was, it was all about the team. We don't have that man in Switzerland. When you're swimming, it's an individual sport. And I made a huge difference. All of a sudden it was about the team. And I, I'll tell you a funny story. Okay. What happened to me with the, it was like in the third month or so we had a really hard set to swim. And in America, you guys swim in the 25 yard pool, which is about 22 meters. We here in Zurich, we swim in the Olympic pool, which is 50 meters. So it's more than twice as long. So that meant there's a lot more turns in the yard pool, right? And so we swim this hard ass set that was 30 minutes, just pain because there was no breathing allowed into the turn and out of the turn and all that. And I was struggling and after 20 minutes, I literally remember, I was like, fuck this, I'm just gonna breathe. And I started like breathing in and out of the turns. And we finished the set and the coach got up there and he's like, Karasek came all the way from Switzerland and he thinks he's something better than you. So he's gonna get out and you guys are gonna repeat the set and he's gonna watch you how Americans do it. And then, you know, I felt so bad and I had to get up on the ball cat and I had to stand there and watch them do the whole set again, 30 minutes. And you know, the, the coach, he kept walking back and forth. And he's like, see, that's how you do it. You pussy, this is how I do it. And I really like a light bulb went off for me because I mean, he meant the best, you know, he, he said, I'm not gonna only make you better swimmers. I'm gonna make you man. And he did that. He, I mean, I have nothing but respect and gratitude and everything. But that opened my mind. That was a yeah. light bulb. What was the, so tell me, what was the aftermath of that with your teammates? How did they react? Man, they took it easy. It's like, as long as I got the learning out of it, they'd take it easy. Just, just don't do it again. It's like, of course, I'm not going to do it again. You know, and, but that light bulb, I, it had to happen. And that went off. And I, I was just like, wow, this is so cool. People hold you accountable here. It's like, you know, you're doing something. It's for something or someone bigger than you. It's literally 70 people on the team that are doing the same thing mm -hmm. and you can't just you know you have to kind of dance in line and that was for me that was a new concept you know absolutely so so how does that tell me how that contrasts to you growing up in switzerland becoming sort of learning how to become a swimmer and you know competing as you were growing up you know through your teenage years how, what was the difference there Man, I wasn't like at the time, I wasn't really like aware of what was going on that like I, it was just on autopilot and I was lucky that I had good guidance, but I didn't really like choose what I really wanted to do. It, it was, you know, I, I wasn't aware of that. It could be better. It's, it was just, I was just going through life on autopilot because I didn't know better. And I think that's, you know, there's some mistakes we all have to make. And that's what I would love like to speak to you about is like, there's a lot of things, a lot of mistakes we have to make to see, to touch something hot that we know it's hot. But there is some things that we can avoid by looking at like what other people did before us by having really good guidance, like world-class guidance, for example. And you can just like avoid a lot of the trouble. One of them would be to just know what you really want. And I never knew that. Yeah. 
I, it's it's actually it's pretty interesting and <clears throat> and somewhat ironic in the sense that I feel like American athletes, particularly the ones I work with who are younger, a little bit younger, are super super sensitive to making mistakes and have a really hard time dealing with it, and they they always want to be perfect. And there's a rare it's rare that a lot of the young athletes that I work with have that kind of growth mindset of like, hey, I made a mistake, but let me take the information and grow from it. It's more like, hey, I beat myself up because I made a mistake. And it's something I really work, have to work hard at in terms of finding ways to shift, help them shift their thinking about, hey, it's okay if you made a mistake, but what are you going to do with it? Similar mm -hmm. to what you described. Mm -hmm. And where, what do you think? Where does that come from? Where is that like, and I, I agree with you. If you're t like, let's say I work with an 11 year old with two actually tennis players, if the emphasis is on winning instead of having fun and learning, the question is, where does it come from? Because it's a good question, right? It's like, where does the child pick it up? Why is it so important to win? And why, is, why isn't it important to learn and, and have fun? What do you think? Um, listen, I, my, unfortunately, my theory is that it comes from the adults, you know, whether oh, yeah. it's coaches and parents. Yeah. I think there's just an over, over emphasis on the performance. And I think a lot of it, frankly, to, you know, if I'm being fair to the, to those adults, I think it's a lack of knowledge about mm -hmm. what it is that actually motivates the athletes, right? What motivates young athletes and anybody, even adults is feeling good about what you're doing, right? Feeling competent, mm -hmm. right? Feeling like you have control over the situation, feel like you're with your friends and having, and you're with people you can trust. When, when you're being criticized constantly, we feel like someone's telling you what to do, or you can't make your mistakes without fear of being punished. Um, or you're constantly kind of operating on, on punishment and reward. Yeah, it, you know, it leads to burnout, it leads to disenchantment. And I just don't think that there's, a, I think there's a lack of awareness, because I think that that's the way that we were coached growing up. I'm old, a little older than you, but we're roughly the same age, I believe. You know, it was always like, hey, can't make a mistake. It wasn't like, hey, just go have a good time. You know, it was like, this is the way my coaches coach me. So I'm not going to pass it on to you because they were tough on me. And listen, I'm all for tough coaching, right? But there has to be a reason for the tough coaching. There has to be, there has to be a method to the madness. And there also has to be a soft side to say, hey, I'm hard on you because I believe in you and I want you to be better versus like, hey, if you're, if you make a mistake, I'm going to pull you out and you're never going back in because you're threatening me as a coach. You know, so it's a constantly a conversation I'm having with athletes and, and parents and coaches about how do, how do we talk to kids? Yeah, that's cool. And it's cool that if the athlete, say the kid or the teen is in the middle, right, has a dream and then it's on us to align around that dream and to support as, as well as we can. And, and that, I agree, you know, it doesn't make anybody bad for not knowing this knowledge. But right. the cool thing is if, especially if parents, that's so cool when they're like, oh, you know, what is that guy? What well, like, there's better ways to do it. Oh, let me hear about it. Like, I want to explore it. And then if you can then build the dream team around that, that's when stuff really happens. And, and I always, you know, one of the quotes is, would you rather be right or happy? It's one of my favorites. And I mean, you know, right. And how true is it? It's, it's it, I try to live by it because at the end of the day, you know, being right doesn't do you any good if you're miserable, right? And it's it's probably going to make you perform worse because you're under the pressure of if I do something wrong, uh, this is going to happen and I can't be free. Um, I think one of the biggest struggles I see is that it's really hard for adults to let kids fall on their face, so, so to speak, right? To take a step back and say, hey, I'm going to let them figure this out for themselves and make the mistakes. And even though I want to jump in and help them, I'm going to force myself to stay back and let them come to me and say, Hey, how can you help me? Because everybody wants to control, right? They, and that's the natural instinct of, well, you're failing or you're hurting. I want to fix the problem for you. I know the answer better because I'm an adult, but maybe that's true in some instances, but if they feel like they don't have control over their own destiny, they're going to resent you and they push back and they shut down. And that's just not a recipe for, happiness or performance performance success or anything that's right and one thing that i want to add are, are you a parent already i do i have two young i have two exactly. 12 and a 10 yeah uh, so just what i want to say is to all the parents listening who's that guy like speaking you know i just want to say that we're, we're speaking of 
peak performing with athletes. But in the end of the day, what I'm realizing is that the real peak performers in life are our parents. That's... And I mean, like, look, with, with, we're, we're talking about peak performers on the field, in the game, in the water. You know, it's a freaking game. But when, mm-hmm. when you're a parent, that is, that is a peak for performers, right? So I have a lot of respect and I'm just, you know, starting to see how because my best friends are now parents and i'm you know i'm like oh my god this is i i did not know all that how much how much it takes to be a good parent it's such a hard job it is you're right you're right the consequences of being a parent i mean blow away the idea that it's important to be good at a sport (laughs) right if you think about it raising a a good person to 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 do the right things and be happy and healthy and you know, it's, it is really hard. And, and I try to listen as a parent, I try to really be compassionate for other parents because I, listen, I go through those moments too, where, you know, I want to lose my, I lose my temper or I get emotional. Now I try not to get emotional about performance. I think I'm pretty good about that because I understand the difference, but if my children make bad choices in, in life about how they treat other people or how they treat themselves, yeah, I'll lose my cool. And I have to realize too, at the same time, it's the same idea. Hey, they're going to make mistakes in their life and I'm not always going to be there. So the faster I can get comfortable with that, the better off I'm going to be and the better off they're going to be. Um, but it's definitely not, definitely not easy. So yeah. tell me about, tell me about your family. I, I don't know much about your background. What, uh, what was it like growing up in, in Switzerland? Yeah. So I have a younger brother, two years younger. I'm 33. He's 31 and my sister's 29. And so we're like two years apart and um, my parents, they took us to a lot of different sports and they never pressured us much. They were like motivating. It's like on a Saturday morning, you know, get your ass up and let's go. But it's not like they didn't force us to do anything. Mm -hmm. Took us to different sports, which was really nice because we could choose what we liked. And for me, what happened was my father was a swimmer. So I, I, we all liked it. And I also played tennis. But with tennis, I would throw the racket around when I was losing. And my parents, I guess they just figured at that age, it's just better if he goes, you know, more often to swimming. And that's what happened. And, uh, but we had the choice. We were never like forced, you know, there's other people. I remember in my club, they got money for every practice they went to from their parents. And that, you know, it's very short lived. Um, and we, we didn't have that. I really enjoyed doing that. I didn't, I wasn't, I actually had to move the club once because my coach, when I was maybe, 12 said I had to train every day and I didn't want to do that. And I, and they kicked me out. So, and then, you know, I developed later when I was quite like, I got faster when I was like 17, 18, which is kind of quite late, but you know, it doesn't matter if you can swim till I swim to 25. So it's all good. Yeah. I, (laughs) I think that's an, I think that's a really important story and an important point in the sense that I think there are a lot of young athletes, particularly here in America who they're, they're training, regardless of sport, you know, whether it's individual sport, team sport has been accelerated. There's a lot of year round sport, you know, whether it's baseball, soccer, basketball, kids are playing all year round. And there's, I think an element, I mean, I hate to choose this word because it's pretty strong, but I think there's some truth to it. I think there's an element of shaming or an element of like, Hey, if I don't play all year round, I'm going to get left behind. Mm -hmm. And I think then it becomes this kind of like tornado of parents getting caught up in it and be like, well, if my son's not participating or my daughter's not in it all year, they're going to fall behind. And that's obviously not true, right? People develop at different rates. People grow at different rates. They're cognitively develop at different rates. Like, you know, you could be a late bloomer and ultimately be, somebody like you who started swimming faster, you know, 17, 18 years old, ultimately you were swam in college and then in the Olympics. So like, you know, it doesn't have to be 12 and 13 years old and show up in the pool in the Olympics at 15, 16, like some swimmers will, right. But by 25, their shoulders are blown out and they're, you know, it, they can't swim anymore because there's so many miles, you know, in the tank. So I mean, what do you think about that? Yeah, you could. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. I mean, you could argue though on the other side. There is. I mean, I'm seeing it with the swimmers here in Switzerland now. Wow, they're really good now. And in America, obviously, a lot more people. And but they are swimming breaststroke now faster than I was swimming freestyle at that age. You know, some of these guys they can't even run and play soccer anymore because their knees are going so like X style because they're just in the water all the time. You know, their joints are super soft and because they're just swimming since the age of five, they're just training, training, training. And so, and then, yeah, but is it healthy? Is it good for the development of the child? Man, I, 
it's hard to say, right? I mean, look, look, Tiger Woods. I mean, he was, you know, he could play golf pro- before he could pro- walk properly, right? And, <laughs> but it was, it was his dad's dream. There's like a really good documentary about it. Like he, there's, it's his dad's dream. It's not his own. And look what what's happening. It's like, I would love to sit down with Tiger Woods if he's hearing that <laughs> and have yeah. a conversation and just ask him how he's feeling about it. if he could really generously speak about that. Because I mean, he, you know, you could argue that in his life, some things are kind of off too, right? Um, yep. I don't want to judge, but right. it's just, uh, yeah. Or if you have kids that can't walk, can't like hold a ball anymore because they're just swimming, swimming. And yeah, you get that feeling like you get sick. Oh, I'm thrown behind. It's like always pressure, pressure, pressure. And right. I, I just can't see that a kid at that age is actually enjoying that. You know, right. I, I agree with that. That's my bias, my tendency. But at the same time, you know, I think if some young athlete says to me, I really love what I'm doing and I really want this and no one's making me do it, then I take it at face value and say, you know what, then go with it, right? Because ultimately, if they understand what they're doing, they understand what their goals are and they understand the consequences of their decisions, then ultimately they're probably going to be able to live with it, right? You know, listen, sometimes we all make, we all do things that we regret, but if an athlete's telling me this is what I want and I'll do whatever it takes, then I'm going to support you in that, right? Because it's just as bad to say to them, no, you shouldn't yeah. do that. I'm, I know better than you. Yeah. Why, why? Because I'm an adult. I don't know. Yeah. I've never been in your shoes. So what, who, who, what's it for me to say? I'll support you however I can, whether it's with mental coaching, whether it's performance training, or whether it's just with a pat on the back and saying, hey, do you need something, right? Yeah. Like, I, I really believe in that. That is what that is wonderful. If you have a kid that is coming to you, no matter what age, and it's really you can, I mean, if we can feel the enthusiasm, we know like we're trained, like people, people are not stupid. We if somebody is passionate about it, you can see it in the person, in the girl, mm-hmm. in the boy, in the team, it doesn't matter. And if that's the case, oh, absolutely. Like, who are we to say no, right? I mean, absolutely. But if it's coming from them, if that's what they want, that's like the best case scenario for any coach. It's like Oh yeah, we got, we got, you know, we got somebody that really is ready to put in the work. That's great. And can be coached. (sighs) Yeah. 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 So, so tell me about how did you tell me about your, your, your journey to the university of Virginia, the recruiting process, how were you being recruited by other schools? How did you end up there? What was that like? Yeah. So I, when I was 19, 20, I had a lot of fights with my coach here in Zurich and now I know it was all my mistake, but at the time, obviously, I thought he was the idiot. So I you know, <laughs> blamed him at the time. So I thought, okay, if I, because I like swimming and I wanted to see how far I can go with it. And I knew America was great for that. And I was like in the age to go to college. And I already had a year in the university here in Zurich. And I just started looking at the schools that had a Division I swim team and a good business school. Not because I wanted to study business. So that's what I checked. And then I saw the University of Virginia. I saw Berkeley in California and I saw Ohio State. And then Virginia just, you know, were, they were like the fastest to answer and all that. And we arranged a recruiting trip and I went there and I, I just loved it. I fell in love. I had a weekend there and it was absolutely phenomenal. I got back. It was a short trip because you can't stay long on campus, right? I think that's like NCAA rules. And I signed after that because I got a 90% scholarship and that was one of the best decisions I ever made. Yeah. I mean, listen, it's a, it's a great town. In fact, one of my closest friends is much older than you are, but he played basketball there in the late eighties, early nineties. And he's taken me there and it's, it's a great place. I mean, I can't imagine how much fun and, and how, you know, how great it was to go to school there. So um, I'd love to send one of my kids to school there. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 it was a good time. I, really, yeah. <laughs> but I think there's a lot of cool schools in America from yeah, what I, that from is what true. I hear. So, yeah. yeah. So what was that like coming to the United States? And obviously it was a new culture in terms of swimming for a team. Like what was the transition to, to, to college like for you? Yeah. So my English wasn't that good. And obviously, like, it was a bit of a culture shock. And I was, you know, I met a lot of people and Americans are very open to like, you know, talking to new people. And in, in Switzerland, and probably generally in Europe, the people are a bit more closed minded. And so and, and we always, I used to also be that way. I used to make fun of Americans for being superficial. 
but I just didn't know better. Right. Then I got there and I was like, damn, you can like talk with anybody. That's super cool. You know, maybe you're wearing a hat, an Eagle's hat and you're having a conversation in the airport and the two hours waiting is over like that. And you never know who you meet. And uh, there's a lot of opportunities in that because sometimes you just meet one person and it changes your life or changes your perspective or, or whatever, or whatever friendship, whatever it is. And now, you know, when I come back, I tell the people about it. It's, ah, yeah, they're so superficial, but I choose superficial and striking a conversation and then deciding if I want to take the next step or not over not speaking any day of the week, you know? So, I love that. I, you know, we're just saying that here in Europe because we don't know better and because we think we're doing it the right way, but I don't think we are. So that, that was wonderful. You know, I just started loving everything about it. My English improved really fast. I was, I was getting good grades and the swimming. I mean, it's it just like that. Everything was done for the team. No more medals for individual performance, just points for the team, for the college team, for UVA swimming. And that, I mean, I, I was loving that. You know, there was something more than yourself. Waking up in the morning, six o'clock wasn't so bad anymore. And, you know, I, it was just amazing. I mean, I was, as I said, a happy kid there. <laughs> Good. Was there anything about college that was hard for you coming over? Man, I, if I'm really honest, uh, I hate to say it, but like the first half year, I was like homesick a little bit. And I was just really looking forward for Christmas. I could go home. And um, we actually, I told my mom I missed the flight on purpose. So she would think I come back later and almost miss Christmas. And then I was there just before, like just before she was so happy to see me. <laughs> home. But I, sure. I remember I was in the airplane and I, I knew my brother was going to pick me up. And I was so anxious. You know, when the time doesn't pass, you have like, eight hours to fly and it just it feels like freaking two days because you're so excited to see your brother that's what i had um but then after that it became like better and better yeah yeah, yeah. i think that's typical for anybody who goes away for the first time the homesickness usually goes away as you make more friends and things get more comfortable but yeah i remember that first semester of college for myself that it was really really challenging you know you're going to a new place you're in your case far away and you know you're making meeting new people and you have all this new stuff thrown at you but it sounds like it worked out it worked out for the best. So how long did you stay in the United States after college? Uh, I went back, man. It was from Michael. The, I was there from 2008 to 2012, which was the Olympic cycle. And then actually uh, in the summer of 2012, I graduated and I went back to, the, to, the, to Switzerland because the games were in London. And we had our swim coach there. He was actually a swim coach on the US team, USA national team because we had guys being swimming for the US team. So he was in London as well. So that's quite a, quite nice to have him there. Great. Yeah. And so t tell me about that experience swimming in the Olympics. Yeah, man, I, so before the race, I mean, I almost shit my pants. <laughs> I could just imagine. Cause you have like, you know, there's the TV, all that pressure, you see all the big shots and, and, and then you have a lot of call rooms. Usually there's just one. And there's like three or four because everything has to be on time. They check if, if your logo is right and they just check everything and make you nervous. And I was sitting there and I was not feeling so hot, to be honest. But I was trying to breathe and I knew that I was, I had not that situation, but I had like nervousness before I dealt with it. And usually when I'm rested, I swim well. I knew that. And then I got out there and it was August 1st, which was the Swiss National Day. And I got out there and I saw we had two tickets. My mom and my sister were there with the Swiss flag, which is red and white, you know, like, so it stuck yep. out. And I saw them there cheering. And then I kind of blacked out and I don't remember anything about the race. <laughs> but I remember touching the race. I saw my time. I swam the Swiss record on Swiss National Day at the Olympics, which was really nice. I uh, didn't make it into the final, but I was, I was happy. I, there's some cool pictures of me right after going to the camera like this with a big smile. I was happy because I swam a personal best time but it was definitely a roller coaster of, of emotions but um yeah something you know when the emotions are high it burns itself in, into yes. your memory right <laughs> that's right you'll never even though you blacked out you'll never forget that experience um so was that like the after the olympics was that sort of the end of your swimming career did you move on from there or did you keep swimming yeah, I kept swimming for a little while. So we took a good break after the Olympics, um, you know, like just resting a little bit, traveling a bit, partying a bit and all that. And then mm -hmm. we started again because I, I wasn't sure if I wanted to quit. I actually wanted to go again for another four years and be in the final. But 
I just I didn't enjoy it anymore in Switzerland. You know, it, it was it wasn't it was back to this individual sport. And comparing that to four years at UVA, I was like, all right, I'm really like mm-hmm. not having that much fun. And that thought kept coming and coming when I was swimming. And after a few weeks on a Friday afternoon, four o'clock in the afternoon, I we started warming up. And after 10 minutes, I just made a committed decision because it came again. I was like, I got out of the pool. I told my coach I'm done. And I never went back. Hmm. And do you feel like that was the, the, the right, looking back, do you feel like that was the, the best decision you could have made? Yeah, man. Yeah. Because there are so many other opportunities that open up after that. And, you know, I think if we don't enjoy what we're doing, man, you know, life is too short. And I know it's like cliche and we all heard it. And But, you know, just hear it again, right? You, it's a good reminder for you. It's a good reminder for me. Like if something comes, uh, yeah, you agree, right? Just, I completely agree. It is too short. I, I, trust me, I wouldn't be sitting, sitting here talking to you if I didn't think that life is too short. I never would have got into this, into this field if I didn't pursue something that I loved as opposed to, you know, working for working a job for money, which I think you might have done at some point too. Yeah. And, uh, you know, money's great, but is it what makes us happy? It doesn't not not for me, you know, maybe some people, but not for me. Yeah, the best is you make you you do what you love and you make a shit ton of money. That's like that's that's why we not quite yet, but but we're getting there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, if you if you can see it in the mind, you can hold it in your hand. It's just a matter of time. Yep. Well, that that's a good segue, right? So that's sort of your philosophy, right? As a as a mindset coach, sort of seeing what you want and going after. Tell me, tell me about your philosophy as a as a mindset coach. Yeah, man. So what happened to me was I just got into this topic because uh, an older guy like kind of woke me up to the idea that I know very little. <laughs> he invited me to a tea here in in Zurich and. I was never invited to a tea. So I went for, for the tea. I was intrigued by that. And he started telling me that everything I'm thinking is very subjective. It's not the truth. And I know very little. And, and then he was saying he also knows very little. And I was like, hmm, that's interesting. And I started, you know, reading more about this and started to find out, holy shit, it's true. It's like there's so much going on here that I cannot see, I cannot hear, I cannot touch. And I was just under the assumption that if I, if it, I can't see it, hear it, smell and taste it, that it doesn't really exist, but it's not true. There is so much going on. And I've come to, and I learned about the spiritual world, how everything is connected, how your thoughts and your feelings attract different people, opportunities into your life. And so I was woken up to that. I did a lot of, um, I took a lot of coaching in that. So like I was coached in that. And I started to apply these things like really quickly. And my life just changed like beyond what I could have imagined Mm -hmm. at the time. And what I found really interesting is that my mentors always believed in me. And now that I'm seeing how, and even if I, when I didn't, by the way, they believed in me because, and I tell you why, because they have been where I was before and they know it's worked for them. They know it's worked for thousands of others. So for them, it was easy to believe in me. And now that it's working for me, when I work with my athletes, I believe in them in times even when they don't, because I know I've done it, many thousands of others have, and so can they. And I I found that so, so interesting, and it changed my life. And then that's all I want to do now. Like, I I do nothing else but that. And I think I'm getting pretty good at it because that's all I do. And that's my passion is to, how can you make your dreams come true? (laughs) Yeah. Listen, I mean, there's nothing more rewarding than being able to help somebody to do that. Exactly. Right. And I've had the similar experiences in my life that people who helped me, coaches, mentors, whatever you want to call them, helped me get to this point of like, hey, I want to do something differently and I don't know how to do it myself. So I need your help. And like that's made all the difference for me. If I tried to do it on my own and thought that I knew everything, I would have just I would have kept getting the same result. And so, I mean, when people ask me like, do you get coaching? And I say, absolutely. Because if, if I don't get coaching myself, then I'm a hypocrite because I'm trying to help you. And like, even if we're smart, even if we know where to go, you know, we still have emotions that get in the way when you have somebody helping you through that process and making you feel good about what you're doing and supporting you and giving you advice that maybe you, you, you can't give to yourself. 
like you need that. Right. And, and it sounds like that's exactly, you know, what you're doing with, with the people you work with. So I have a question, Michael, sure. because what you're saying a hundred percent. Now, my question is, what do you think sets these people apart that say, okay, this is where I am. This is where I want to go. Let me ask, as you said, you ask how to get there, because what you find is that these people here that know, you know, how they got there, they actually, most of them enjoy helping. They enjoy contributing. They enjoy telling their story. So what's the difference? Because I tell you one thing I know from my mentor, when we had a seminar, Bob Proctor, it's like from the secret, he's kind of, kind of famous. Um, what he said, he, they had the top sales guy from finan Prudential Financials or something uh, from America. They had him there. They have 20,000 salespeople in the company and had the top guy there because he got like some kind of award and he had him on stage and he asked him, how many of the 20,000 salespeople in your company have invited you to a breakfast or a brunch or a lunch and asked you six or more prepared questions of why you're so good and selling so much? Zero. Zero. So, you know, there's a paradox that the people that are like have a lower level of awareness, for some reason, they have, they don't often don't ask the people that have a higher level of awareness. And I just want to say lower and higher doesn't mean better or worse. It just means they know a bit more in that field. It doesn't make them a better person. So what sets those guys apart that have a lower level of awareness and say, let me ask the guy, and the others, they're just like make all kinds of excuses and they stay there and they keep progressing at a slow rate. What, what do you think is the difference? I mean, that's a really hard question to answer. I, I think it has to do, it, my opinion, right? It's only an opinion, right? Because there's so many things that could impact mm. what you just described, right? To me, I think it, it's confidence, right? Mm. Being confident to know what you don't know and to ask for help means you're dropping your ego and saying, yep hey, like, I don't know everything. And I want to get to where I, I want to go. And you can help me do that. Right. I think a lot of people want to be right. And they don't want to be happy to go back to what we were talking about before. They would rather be right, because they don't want to show the flaws in their in themselves, right? They're trying to protect themselves from mm -hmm. having people see who they really are. And so I guess ultimately, it comes down to a lack of vulnerability or an inability to be vulnerable with themselves. And so a lot of it is just expressing emotion or expressing the way they feel and what they think. And so it's easier just to keep it to themselves and say, Hey, I don't want anybody to know what's going on with me. So I'll just keep it to myself. And that keeps them stuck. And that's the way I was personally for most of my life until I got to a point where I couldn't live with myself that way anymore. And I was so desperate for a change that I started to just do a 180 and say, Hey, I'll take advice from anybody because I don't know shit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I'm yeah. saying? And that, mm -hmm. that changed my life, but you can't make somebody do that. A lot of times I think it is desperation or I think it's, they don't know, people don't know what to do. And so they finally are willing to ask for help versus, Hey, you know, like no one's really born that way, especially in this place, in, in this country, people are so, I feel like people are so egocentric. You know, and that's not a criticism. I think it's just a fact that they're not willing to ask for help or show that weakness or show that vulnerability. And that hurts them. It's not, it's, a, it's ironic in that respect. Mm -hmm. And I want to say in America is like the coaching market, just, just looking at the coaching market is a lot bigger than in Europe. I mean, I'm from, from my experience, me talking to a future client is, Oh, it's a lot easier in with Americans in, in like, not for everyone, of course, but on average, because Americans are, I mean, they also have these entrepreneurial big events, you know, seminars, people go to in Europe, it's, it's even tougher. So, and, I, yeah. um, hmm. but yeah, I, I really think, you know, the fastest way from A to B is to ask the people that have walked the path before. And when you have obstacles there, what you'll find, and that is, I think, a really beautiful illustration is if you have an obstacle there, it's literally the person that is at B helping you is helping you pull you over the obstacle. So it's actually a lot easier for you. It's starting to pull before you're right in front of it. So you can climb like slowly and then you're over it and then slowly down on the other way. That's really, that's really what happens. And I think that's what like, one of the skills to learn is learn to ask. It is so simple, but that could be to get 
funding for your sports career. It could be that somebody drives you to practice. It could be that you get sports nutrition inputs. It gets and in the mental, it's like anything you want, like a good girlfriend, a boyfriend, like anything. Mm -hmm. Learn to ask, right? Absolutely. It's 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 so interesting you say that because one of the things I believe is a critical skill for transitioning to from high school to college here in America is just that, right? The ability to ask for help because you go from being in America, the best player on your team, maybe the best player in your county, the best player in your state. Then you go to, a, if you go to a division one school and everybody's like you, everybody was a star, right? And so now you're back at square one of like, hey, I'm just like everybody else. You got two choices, right? You could try to do it yourself or you could try to get that help and use the resources that are at your disposal to say, hey, I know that I'm not the best anymore and I wanna to get to here. That's How right. am I gonna do that? Well, I need that coaching, I need that help, right? I need the sports psychologist, I need the nutritionist, I need the strength coach, I need the tutor, I need all these people around me to elevate me because I can't do it on my own and they know they've been here. But I think a lot of times we're not wired that way. We, we just expect it to come to us yeah. because it's always come to us. Yeah. And, you know, that's a hard lesson to learn because it's not just coming to you. People yeah. aren't just going to show up on your door and say, hey, I want to help you in most that's, cases. That's right. Last time, I, I don't think there's anybody, one per two people came to me as like, can you coach me? Everybody else is like me initiating. But what you're saying, and that's why you're doing good work with the podcast and kind of, you know, getting the message out for people to hear is... And actually, you know, athletes should know that, that it's going better with a coach. They should know that because they should know if somebody cares, if they can trust somebody and that person cares and wants the best for them and is knowledgeable in their field, it's, you know, they should know that. But as you said, we're not wired for that. And for some reason, we think like the coach in football, that just, that, that's it. That's the only coach we need. But that's actually the cool thing. Once you're being coached in different areas of life, You'll know the value of it. You know how much faster you progress, how much more, how much happier you are, and so on. And less struggle, you're learning faster. And then you're going to be become like a lifelong learner in a sense. And that's why you always have a coach. And it doesn't always have to be the same because it might be that you need that coach for half a year that can help you as you do transition from high school to college. But then it's another one because you've done your job, right? It doesn't have to be you for until the rest of the life. But that, that's why... You, you learn to find your mentors. You learn to attract these people in your life and you learn to ask for, for, for the right help. And yeah. then at every stage in life where you are, you're having a shitty relationship, okay? Take self-responsibility. Look what you can do. Don't blame others and go get help. And, and you do that and it's like, oh, it worked, cool. Now I, I wanna get physically stronger. So you do the same thing and you learn to do yeah. that, right? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I think sometimes the hardest relationship to build is the one with your sport coach, right? And I talk to athletes about this a lot. It's something that I, I try to emphasize is, is trying to help them on you know, build empathy for their coaches, right? If you think about being in high school, your high school coach is probably a teacher. He makes, you know, a teacher salary. He coaches because he loves sports. Then you go to college, your coach is a coach. He gets paid probably hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars, depending on your sport, to win games, to win meets. Right. And so that form of coaching might be a little bit different. Right. And so then it becomes like, well, if you don't perform, I don't want to, I don't want to help you, or it's a different kind of relationship. And so if I go to my coach and ask, Hey, for help, they're going to say, Oh, they're going to think I'm weak, or they're going to think I'm not ready for this. And so I don't want them to know that I'm struggling because they're going to hold it against me. And they're not going to play me because they think I'm not ready. And so they keep it to themselves and that makes it even worse. And so I think that that's a big challenge for high school kids going to college is that it is a business. And maybe you don't feel like the coach cares about you because he's only trying to win games, which is probably not true. Right. But if you don't have a conversation with him, you're never going to get to know him as a person. Or if you don't take that risk, they're never going to know where you're coming from and you're just going to get buried and then you're going to internalize it. And then it gets harder and harder. And then all those mindset things that we try to work on, no matter what I do as a mental performance coach for that athlete, if he's not getting the feedback that he needs and I'm not there to help him, that work is going to unravel unless they're just a really, really mentally tough person. And so, 
you know, communication is critical to, to, with a coach. And then I think that that's some, some place that we struggle a little bit too. face to face communications, walk into the office and say, coach, I need help. You know, yeah, man. Yeah, man. That is, I, I can tell you a short uh, story. I had a soccer player and he made a bad mistake in, so there was a goal scored for the other team and that lost him the match. And because he did a penalty, right. With the, with the hands. Ball. Um, and so he felt super bad about that and was, you know, almost depressed and sad and, and not feeling good. And you know, the saying worry is the misuse of imagination. So if we have in our mind, if we don't know what the coaches think of us, if we don't know what the teammates think of us, we try to fill in the blanks. Now, when you're in a worrying state, you're going to fill in the blanks with worry because you're not optimistic in that moment. So you fill in with all the worry and your imagination goes wild about all oh, this. And they're not going to play me anymore. My teammates hate me. They think I'm dying, this and that, right? So what I told him to do is that on that day, I had him call, call the coach first and tell him that he's working with a sports psychologist now that he's feeling terribly sorry about the mistake, that it's really bugging him, that he's worried what they think, what the teammates think and of himself, and that he wants to make it better, never make that mistake again, and that he's prepared to do anything to get better. Now, when you go to the coach and the coach hears that, what's the coach going to do? He's like, this is fucking awesome, right? There's a guy who's realized that, and it's actually showing strength. Now, same thing when you go to the teammates. They're not going to say, you're a loser, like I, could have, I would never have done that. Look at Cristiano Ronaldo. He made the biggest mistakes. He was crying on the pitch, but nobody remembers him for that. They remember him for being the best football player ever. So like, you know, like when you hear it from your teammates and your coaches, what they really think, not what you make up with your imagination that's gone <laughs> right. wild, 100%. you know what it is and you have the information. And that's why you have to communicate with the people instead of sitting there and worrying because it's just going to drain you and mm -hmm. you're not the best version of yourself when you're worried. And then again, you find that the people are on the same team. They're here to support you. And you wouldn't dismiss a teammate for making a mistake, right? Of course. Right. Absolutely. That, th there are two questions I always ask athletes is, one, would you talk to your teammate the way you talk to yourself? Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. And right. And what's the worst that could happen? Right? Like, what's the worst that, you know, you're, you have all these scenarios in your head, but if you think about it, what really is the worst thing that's going to happen as a result of this mistake? And I think a lot of times it, it, it almost is like, oh, you're right. Like, like it's not as bad as I'm making it out to be, but unless you get that outside of yourself, outside of your head, a lot of times there's no amount of rationalization you could do to make yourself stop worrying. And that's why having other people to help is so important, right? To normalize it and say, hey, you would never do this to somebody else. Why are you doing it to yourself? And yeah. I think that a lot of times that puts it in perspective or at least starts building the awareness towards, okay, I did this, I do this. How do we make the change? What are some of the things that we could do to change the way I think about these situations? And that's, you know, that's at least the way I try to do things with my, with my clients. I mean, what about, what about you? Tell me about who you're working with and what that looks like. And um, I'm just curious more about like what your practice looks like right now. Yeah, man. So uh, it's only professional athletes at the moment and um, a lot of tennis players and uh, soccer triathlon. Um, yeah, but a lot of tennis players, no swimmers. Oh, right, there's one swimmer now, but um, not one-on-one -on -one yet. So and what I do is first thing always is what do you want? It's the simple question, but what do you really want? Like, what, what, are you, what do you really want? And then we start working with activating the imagination. Like, really, I use imagination visualization a lot because this is something that is, for a lot of athletes and people in general, it's dialed down. We all had it as kids. Like, you know, you give a kid a broom, and I will use the broom as a horse, and then you tell it, like, give me the broom, and it will not hear it because it's sitting on a horse, right? So... <laughs> The imagination was wild when we were young and it's just dialed down because what do they do in school? They'll tell you, tell you to pay attention, to not fantasize. If you daydream, they slap, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's dialed down. They always tell you, be realistic and, and, and be an adult and all that. So we don't really allow ourselves to just close our eyes and imagining what we would really like without knowing how to get there. And so that's like the step number one. Yeah. We, we, we start doing those exercises and every athlete that works with me one-on-one -on -one, is that 
he or she has to commit 10 to 15 minutes a day to do these exercises that I do as well, that I learned from Bob Proctor and William Whitecloud, those exercises that reprogram your subconscious mind, that put the belief where it should be. And it's not like just positive. It's not just affirmations based on bullshit. It's affirmations based on what your heart wants. And that are, these are the good kind of affirmations. The one, if you're, if I think I'm ugly and I'm just going in front of the mirror, say I'm pretty, I'm pretty, I'm pretty, I'm pretty. That doesn't work because the subconscious mind is not stupid. It will say, it doesn't well, believe it. Yeah, exactly. It actually get, does the opposite. The opposite. That's right. But if you have affirmations that are based on your heart, like, can I read to you what I wrote three days ago? Just my daily exercise. A hundred percent. I'd love it. Okay. So I, we always start like we bring it in the presence, right? So I'm so happy and grateful now that we're a thousand coaches strong in the tribe of athletes and that we serve and work with the world's best football players, fighters, and tennis players. Every one of my coaches is a former pro athlete who's worked with me and had so much success with the mental training that this is all he or she wanted to do after her career. We're getting millions of views on our YouTube channel, and it's every athlete's dream to be coached by us. I'm traveling around the world to Champions League games and Grand Slam tournaments and UFC fight nights as a fan, mentor, and friend of the world's most inspiring athletes. So you write that down and, you know, I, I get goosebumps thinking about it now because it, it gets that picture up for me. And, and that's what you want to do. You want to like, and it doesn't need to take long, but you want to condition yourself to have a picture of your dream to flash in your mind again and again, like be reminded, have a goal card or something like that. You know, have something that you see multiple times a day, put it on your bottle, like put it on your bottle when you're in training, something about belief, something what you really want, be reminded of that. And you'll see with a bit of time, not much time, a bit of time, that repetition will start to pay off and it'll really change your life. I'm curious. So the, how do you find the commitment level to be with your athletes? To them um, doing, doing what you ask them to do? Man, I mean, they got to commit. They got, they, I mean, they pay me a lot of money, right? <laughs> so they, and they know what they're going to be in. I say from the beginning, I don't have them sign anything. Because right. I've also had days when I didn't do um, the thing and it still worked, right? But I, it's just, it's about a routine and just think yeah. how powerful habits are or how destructive habits are. So just think if you, and also it's like if you have a habit to see the positive, to focus on the good instead of the worry. That, that is literally, that is a habit. My mother worries about me when I travel at the age of 33 all the time because it's a habit. It doesn't make any sense. She could be asking all the empowering questions. What is he learning? What is he doing? Who's he meeting? But she's worried because it's a habit because she probably had good reason to worry when I was younger. But it's just a habit. So mm -hmm. just think if you see the positive, if you focus on what's good and now so you spend all your energy on what you want and not what you don't want. And that's, that's really, that will change your life because all we are so powerful. And look, I, I want you to like, look at this. Everything that you see around us is, is we created that like this pen, it first existed just as a thought, as an idea. And with time, it moved into physical form. The phone that I'm using here, or, yeah, there's a phone, right? It existed in Steve Jobs mind as a thought. And with a bit of time, it moved into physical form. Right. And but Michael how? Jordan. But, but how did that happen? That happens because we can create, like animals can't do that. We have these higher faculties. There's a power that is flowing through us. And when we change our vibration, we move, we take different actions and the actions will bring us different results. We change the level of our frequency by going where we want to go in our mind already. And not waiting on this to happen, on and then I can do that. It's, it's it, so I, I think that what I was hoping you would get at, which you did, is it's because it's a thought, but it's the action that brings the thought to life, yeah. right? But without the thought, we never would have gotten there, yeah. right? Exactly. And so, like I think about my own existence and my last five or seven years of my life, and how I envisioned my life to be or I wanted my life to be in this world of coaching and helping other people and what I wanted that to be. And it's really coming true because I envisioned it, but I also, because I did, right? Every action, and I talk to athletes about this all the time. If you want something, right? You tell me you want to be a professional athlete. Great. 
I love it, right? It's possible. Well, what are you going to do, right? If your actions don't align with that vision, then you're never going to get to where you want to go. And that's okay because you don't want to do it. But there's also a consequence to that, right? So if you're not taking those steps to get that vision, you don't really want it that much. Right. And you're, or if you do, you're going to regret one day that you didn't do what you could have done to get you there. I can help point you in that direction, but I cannot make you do it, right? right? And I think that that's probably the most challenging thing for me as a coach is to say, hey, I know what you want. And I think I know what I can do to help you get there. And then have somebody be like, yeah, I get it, but I don't want to do it. Yeah. And it's very frustrating. But I, I love the way you present it because it, there needs to be vision. The imagination does need to turn on because all of us, whether you're a mother or you're an athlete, we always default to what? What's going to go wrong? What threatens us? What's going to hurt us? Yeah. You know, we want to protect ourselves and we don't want to take those risks because if we do, we're going to get clubbed. And you're never going to get to where you want to go if you don't stick your neck out and say, you know what, I might get clubbed, but if I do, what am I going to do with it? Am I going to learn from it and grow from it? Or am I going to crawl back in the hole and be like, you know, it's easier just not to, to do anything. And you find out it'll get easier. It'll get easier. Yes. And, you know, by the way, if you, if you say like, this is frustrating as a coach, that what, what you can try to focus on, uh, this is what I, what I try as well is, because it is frustrating when you see somebody who says that he or she wants, but doesn't take the step. Right. But you gotta, we gotta get them emotionally involved because we make decisions with our emotions because thoughts are the first, that's like the origin mm -hmm. because we can think whatever we want, but then you gotta get, you gotta involve your subconscious mind because your subconscious mind is running your body and it's your emotional mind. That's how your emotions make your decisions on and move your body into action. So you want to use the thoughts because you can kind of control that if you're working with somebody and, you know, you have them close their eyes, maybe put the hand on the heart and start to feel that emotion. Go there in the mind, use the imagination to go there. And then you know how it is. If you're getting nervous before a competition, your heart starts to beat faster. It's like your subconscious mind. Even when you do that, I mean, the night before the race, your subconscious cannot differentiate between a real experience and just imagine one, mm -hmm. if you're, if you're going in front of a thousand people and the night before you think about that, you might get nervous, right? Even though there's no threat whatsoever and you're not speaking until tomorrow, but it's because the imagination is so good about that, about the bet, about the worry. It's so good. And so imagine if we can take that and make it so good for what we really want and we get really emotionally involved in it. And that's the trick. And that's mm -hmm. when we're like, okay, I'm going to do this. Cause I really, I'm not just thinking, thinking, thinking I'm taking action. So that's the link to really bring in the emotion. I love it. Well, we only have a couple minutes left cause we got to wrap up here, but just if I, if I could ask you one more question. So if there's any one thing, that you would leave the listeners with or, or want them to remember from our conversation, what would it be? It would be to have a big dream because that is step number one for me. It, it's just like, it, it's to have a big dream because why else would you want to do anything if you, if you don't know why you're doing it, like have a big dream and whatever that is like, not, it doesn't have to be world champion in, in, in swimming or, you know, in, it, it doesn't matter, but a big dream, something that excites and scares you at the same time, something that gives you the opportunity to grow and to become like a more well-rounded person, something that it really, yeah, excites and scare you, scares you at the same time. I think that's, that, that's what I would do. What about you, man? That's a, that's a question that I would love to hear from you as well. Um, yeah, you got me on that one. What, I mean, <laughs> listen, I, I think, I think the, you know, for me, I think the one thing I always try to, to impart to the, the athletes I work with, particularly young ones, is that, you know, I think they need to understand the power of their decisions, right? Every decision has a consequence. And, you know, I think it's okay to make decisions that aren't ideal, but we've got to learn from them. And I think a lot of times when we make a bad decision or we say something's wrong or something's right, it's not, that's not it. It's, am I making a good choice to move me in a positive direction? And if I don't, then what am I going to do to learn from it? I'm, I'm just a big believer in decision-making and it's not absolute. And I think that's really hard when you go back to the conversation of, 
you know, perfectionism and is it okay to make a mistake, right? People tiptoe around decisions because they're afraid they're going to do something wrong rather than saying, hey, what's the positive that's going to come out of this, right? Let me go get this. And if I fail, so what? I'm going to learn from it and I'm going to keep going. That's not a mindset that a lot of a lot of young athletes have, at least in my experience these days. And, you know, I could talk all day about why that is just like we tried to a little bit. So with that, I want to thank you for joining the podcast. Hopefully we could do it again. Uh, Cause I think we could probably have gone another hour. And you're coming <laughs> on mine, man. You're coming I'm on in. my show when uh, I'm ready. <laughs> I, I, I am absolutely. And I would love to, I think it would be awesome. Um, I love doing this. Um, I love having these conversations and hopefully they help the people who are listening and you know, your energy was awesome, man. It was, it was great to talk to you. I learned a lot from you and likewise, uh, brother. Thanks for best. having me. My pleasure. I wish you the best, David. You too, Michael. Take care.